everyone. It's so lovely to have you all here with us today. Um, my name is Catherine Metz. I'm assistant professor of ethnomusicology here at Oberlin Conservatory, and I'm thrilled to have with me today some true scholars in amazing fields here at Oberlin as part of our sta stage left productions where they'll be discussing Beethoven and Beethoven's relevance to music, to classical music, and of course, thinking about the canon. So I'd like to start at the top with Peter Takash, who is professor of piano, who just opened up with some beautiful Beethoven. Thank you very much, Peter. And I would also like to introduce Jesse Jones, assistant professor of composition. And of course, our esteemed Ari San Martino, who has graciously joined us, professor of history. So um, perhaps all of you can get started thinking a little bit about Beethoven and his importance. Thank you so much, Catherine. This is, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Uh, this being the 250th anniversary of uh, Beethoven's birth. And it was going to be a big celebration, but due to present circumstances, it's been put on hold a little bit, but I'm happy to talk today about maybe something we title Does Beethoven Matter? And uh, hopefully the answer at the end of this chat will be yes, a lot. Uh, but, you know, we can certainly examine some aspects of Beethoven's relevance and even his uh, importance today. Um, so, you know, obviously I started with the movement of the Pathetic Sonata which is recognizable by all people, I would think. Uh, I suppose this is recognizable. I would assume. So there's a figure that is sort of an icon of classical music in the world. And so we're gonna look a little bit at to see why that is and you know how they came to be. So uh, I'm gonna ask uh, Ari, um, if she could uh, talk to us a little bit about Beethoven's significance as a historical figure at the border of the 19th century in Germany and, and how it kind of evolved over time. Hi, thank you, Peter. And thank you um, to both of you for joining me in this conversation. Um, you know, it's impossible to think of a figure in German culture and classical music in, in some ways almost world history uh, that is more, continues to have more relevance as Beethoven does and continues to be known the way that Beethoven does. And I think there are several answers that we can give, right, for why that's the case. One of those is simply, you know, to say, well, he's a musical genius. And, and we'll certainly talk about um, that as well. But I wanted to sort of say a couple things about Beethoven as a historical figure which is that really shortly after, or almost at, with his later life, you know, he'd already become this incredibly important person um, in German culture for sure, representing this kind of new German nation at the start of the 19th century. His own personal story of struggle, now certainly he was not the first um, composer to have struggled, but it becomes part of this myth of someone who is, uniquely human, uniquely, and at the same time, uniquely and specifically German. In some ways you can chart the rise of Beethoven's um, status as a cultural figure in the 19th century with the rise of the importance of German culture more generally. In fact, the two almost come to be synonymous with each other in the 19th century. And yet, what's a remarkable thing is that even after the sort of tragedies and, and kind of horrors of 20th, early 20th century German history, Beethoven continues to have an importance, not necessarily just as a German figure, but actually as a kind of international, transnational figure, um, even beyond that. And we can talk a little bit about why that is and how that is, but I thought it was interesting maybe to start by thinking about how Beethoven in the 21st century, in some ways is as relevant as he is, was in the 19th century, but not necessarily for the same reasons. Yeah, he somehow uh, has endured over time and through various kinds of historical upheavals and so on. And so I'm going to ask Jesse to uh, address the idea of what is a genius? Is there such a thing? And what are the, some of the criteria that we apply to be able to call somebody a genius? And in that connection also, what is a masterpiece? Uh, so as a yeah. composer, would you comment on that? 
Well, <clears throat> I don't think I can really comment on what is a genius necessarily, but I would like to think that a genius doesn't know that they're a genius. And I would like to think, I don't have any sort of um, you know, historical validation for what I'm about to say, but I would like to think that Beethoven didn't know that he was a genius, but was just striving to make the best music he could, um, wanting to express himself in as deep a way as possible and to strive for some sense of, of humanity. And I think the quality of the work is determined later to be either a work of genius or to be a masterpiece. Mm -hmm. one, thing I, one thing that I think for, at least for myself, as far as a masterpiece goes, um, First of all, I, I want to say that I don't think every piece by Beethoven is a masterpiece. I think there are many, many works that are incredible, incredible, incredible works, um, masterworks even. But there are others that kind of fall by the wayside and are kind of fluffy by comparison. And I think that's fine. Much, much of his output, for instance, was even written on commission and just sort of quickly dashed off just to, mm -hmm. to make some money. So there's also that commercial side of Beethoven as well. Um, but as far as a master work goes, a masterpiece that is going to, in my opinion, that has to be something that transcends sort of the creation of the thing. It, it transcends borders, be those actual borders, whether they be aesthetic or stylistic borders. Mm -hmm. um, and they have to be relevant across a whole spectrum of experience and um, e expression etc so I as far as as far as what makes a genius I don't know but I think a masterwork has to possess the ability to reach people on on myriad levels from the most superficial to the to, you know deeper layers mm -hmm. as well and there are so many of Beethoven's works works that, that do that really masterfully I, I really say. appreciate your your comments uh, because uh, Probably a person doesn't know they're a genius, and we don't even know if a masterpiece has been created until time has passed, and somehow it has uh, endured through time. Uh, I personally have a couple of criteria for a masterpiece. One of them, uh, to me, is the ability to create large structures out of very simple materials. Uh, there's a kind of uh, structural breadth to the thing, and I was going to play a little bit of the theme from the last sonata, Opus 111. This is second movement. It's in two movements, and he sent it to the publisher, and the publisher wrote to him and said, and when can we expect the third movement, which was supposed to be some kind of a fluffy rondo or something? And of course, that's absurd to us because the second movement is this incredible uh, peak of transcendence. So it's uh, theme and variations, which was one of the stock forms that was available to everybody. And uh, it's also in C major, which is the fundamental key. Uh, and it goes through an incredible number of transformations, starting from a very, very simple uh, theme, which is marked uh, Adagio Semplice Molto Cantabile. simpler. It basically uses primary chords like C major and 5, it's G major. And then each variation thereafter increases the pace like a the boogie woogie variation obviously not by Beethoven by later people um, it's hard to encapsulate that in 30 seconds but uh, there's an incredible return of the main theme after a transition there goes a and it's like 
opening of a great river. And at the end, he brings that theme in a very high register. Uh, <laughs> There's a trill, and on, <clears throat> on the bottom there's triplet. This is the end of his very last sonata, and to me, it's an incredible transformation of simple materials into something that approaches pretty much heavenly music. Uh, so I would say that mm, I don't know if anybody can argue with the fact that this is a masterpiece. Um, you know, of course, we're talking about the, the mature old uh, Beethoven who was deaf and it was working mostly internally. So I want to ask Ari a question, again, kind of historical one about uh, whether Beethoven's fame and sort of looming presence over the 19th century and maybe over 20th also uh, turned into an obstacle for anybody that did it block any other avenues or was there this kind of reverence that didn't allow people to uh, approach it in a kind of a realistic way? You know, it's, it's a fascinating question. Um, and I want to approach it from a couple of different angles. I mean, one is that, and to say in, so, in some sense, I guess my answer, the short version of it is that, yes, it presents an obstacle and it also provides a kind of inspiration. And that's because Beethoven becomes really in his own lifetime, the sort of symbol of this great composer. So much so that, you know, music, the, the idea of a, of, the, of a musical canon is really a 19th century invention. The idea that you would play older, you know, you, you know music was something that's performed for particular, or composed for particular moments, particular people, particular patrons, and then it kind of doesn't entirely go, it mostly kind of goes away. And that changes in the 19th century. And it's Beethoven in large measure, it's his music that prompts that change. And then the rediscovery of people like Bach, um, you know, the sort of reanimation of kind of other cla of classical composers, like Mozart, et cetera, that form what we now think of as the musical canon. Beethoven in some ways in the sort of reverence that people have for Beethoven's music is part of what, uh, what creates that. So on some very, in some very like almost structural way, later composers would have to deal with the fact that something that contemporary composers have to deal with, it's just that audiences really want to hear Beethoven. And they continue to, to listen to Beethoven. Beethoven continues to be there. And it's, you know, in some sense, if he had been like a really bad composer, maybe that would not have happened, right? But so, so there is a kind of structural obstacle on some level. You could also say that there's a way in which later composers of the 19th century have to contend with like, what does it mean to create music after Beethoven? Um, and part of that is a question of, well, okay, say the ninth ends with this triumphant chorus, this final symphony, right? Well, what is the room for vocal music in the symphonic form after that point? Is that something that you should go further with? Is it something that you should retreat from? Has he done it so perfectly that there's no room for anyone else? What does it mean to innovate, right? And again, that's a kind of relation to this role that Beethoven plays as becoming really the canonical composer in that, in that context. There's also in the 19th century, a question of like Beethoven simultaneously becomes the symbol of universal genius and of German genius. Mm -hmm. So now you have other cultures, other people sort of like, well, where's our Beethoven? You know, is there a Beethoven of the Swiss? Is there a Beethoven of the Hungarians, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, and this question of universality is one that Beethoven you know, presents. And then also there's the fact that, you know, because Beethoven is such a genius, you know, and, and I mean that, you know, in both historical sense, he gets defined as a genius, but his music is, is wonderful. It remains inspirational. So all those ways in which he provides a kind of like, um, like there's this anxiety uh, related to his, his figure, his, his stature. There's also this way in which his music remains a kind of wellstone for people to, 
to come back to a to touchstone. I'm not sure what the word is, <laughs> what do you use? But for composers, um, and really not just composers, for other um, artists and intellectuals to kind of keep returning to and keep discovering new things. And that continues really, I, I mean, I would probably argue to this day and, and beyond. No, that, those are wonderful points. And uh, I know that, for example, Brahms uh, was afraid of writing a symphony until he was in his 40s because he didn't know how to follow Beethoven. You know, he didn't think anything would be possible. And I think Mahler was afraid of writing a 10th symphony because to break the record of nine would be just un, you know, unthinkable and so on. And also you mentioned something very interesting about a kind of hegemony of German music uh, in the 19th century especially. And I think so, you know, towards the middle and end of the century, some national schools started to emerge you know, like uh, Bohemian school with Borjak and so on and Smetna, and then there was a Greek in Norway and Spanish music. And so there was some kind of trying to work one's way out from under this kind of German domination, so to speak, you know, and it might be, it might have started with Beethoven. So Jesse, do you have a reaction to, to those ideas that Ari mentioned? Well, I think there's so much in that upon which I'm not really, you know, qualified to comment, but there is one thing I would like to say is that I think I am a composer today because of Beethoven. Um, and I feel everything, you know, like the angst that Brahms felt or that Mahler felt about sort of the, the looming genius of Beethoven was with me from a very early age. But because Beethoven was my favorite composer when I was young, I mean, I'm talking very young, and his music meant so much to me from early on, like, it was because of Beethoven's music that I sort of wanted to pursue a similar mode of artistic expression. And so I, I can definitely see where the, the work of the, you know, the looming character of Beethoven is one that could stifle creative thought, but it can also greatly inspire. And there's one thing I'd like to add concerning sort of why he's a looming figure. It has so much to do with his music, of course, but so little of that is actually his fault <laughs> at all. I think a lot of it just is that um, it's society's doing actually, and maybe even largely someone like Nietzsche who laid so much stake on Beethoven philosophically and in his writings of just, and I'm sure that Dr. San Martino can say more about this, but you know, who basically said that Beethoven was one of the first people to allow passion and pathos to drive their musical creation. And that just puts a lot of more, a lot more focus sort of on the um, Sturm und Drang aspect of Beethoven actually. Mm -hmm. um, but I just, what I wanna mention is, is there's just so much more than the Sturm und Drang in his music. There's there, largely, I would say more than that is humor and levity. That's true. And I think those are, those are some of the themes, the human themes in his music that have made his that have made it move forward into the into the future just as much as as, as like the struggling artist aspect mm -hmm. um, and just one more thing along these lines i actually think that music is a particular kind of art form that when when it's when a piece by a certain composer is played especially again and again and again all the aspects that we associate with that composer are sort of resurrected with each new performance of it and since beethoven's story is really incredible and the music is so superb i think that that those feelings of beethoven um come back to us every time we hear a piece of music he he is imbued in the very sinew of the work if that makes sense yeah no it makes sense um and so i guess i'm not sure if that actually answered the question no or anything, but, but those are my thoughts it, yeah well you know what i enjoy hearing from you is this whole idea of craftsmanship you know that the composer doesn't know they're a genius. They're just doing their work, you know, getting up in the morning and facing the blank page and so on. Uh, so you just put one foot in front of the other and what comes out hopefully is something worthwhile or something masterful. And um, I do want to mention to me, uh, there's some universal themes that come through in Beethoven's music, uh, which are, I think, uh, global and also relevant to today. Um, let me say, for example, the idea of fate versus human, um, 
you know, implacable destiny or the gods, and then the the vulnerable human who is uh, trying to exist uh, in the face of these forces. And the best example is from the fourth concerto, uh, the second movement, which is supposed to be the Orpheus story, but I'm going to play just the beginning of it. The um, the orchestra is strings only playing in unison, and then the piano answers, and it's supposed to be the gods versus Orpheus. conversation and the amazing thing about it is that by the end the human has actually tamed the the oppressive forces so there's an incredible uh, the conquest of the meek shall inherit the earth kind of thing uh, and the other thing that emerges uh, is in his opera Fidelio which was a uh, labor of struggle and love I suppose and he was not a natural opera composer uh, he was not, he was no Mozart, shall we say. <laughs> um, but he tried to put his ideals into this work uh, about freedom and justice and injustice, and of course about conjugal love, which was, uh, you know, an important uh, idea for him. Um, and just recently there was a production of Fidelio, and in the middle of this first act, there's a prisoner's chorus where they are actually allowed to leave their cells so they can see the sun and breathe the air. It's a very moving scene. Um, and the American director who directed this opera uh, actually trained American prisoners to sing Beethoven's uh, Ode to Freedom from Fidelio. And it's, uh, I think it's available on YouTube. Uh, and, you know, to actually have prisoners in the USA in the 21st century singing Beethoven in German <laughs> from memory. Uh, you know, it's really a, an incredibly powerful um, uh, creation. And, you know, it, may, it brings about Beethoven's relevance. Um, so, you know, let me ask Ari. Oh, yes, Jesse. I think that really speaks to the power. And when during the first question I was answering, about sort of what is genius or what is a masterpiece. And I said that it has to transcend borders, uh, uh, any type of border. This is one of those aspects that I think are, is so powerful in all of music and Beethoven does this so well. I, I'm, I'm reminded by that story, which, which is very moving. I've actually seen the video of that. Wow. It's, but um, the Western Eastern, the West Eastern Divan Orchestra, uh, the Daniel Barenboim Baron Baron put together right. like a couple decades ago. This, this, um, my introduction to that orchestra was a recording they made of Beethoven's Sixth Symphony, um, and I think they've also played the Third Symphony. And just the like, it's an orchestra comprised of just, you know, Israelis and musicians from across uh, the Arab world, and it's. And many of them to be in the orchestra risk their lives and they have a hard time even getting together because of like the conflicts across across their borders. And when they get together and play music, you can just tell that there is so much joy in it. And the way that they play and the music they play is kind of problematic as far as some of that those things go, like the music of Beethoven, this intensely German music. They play Wagner, right. for instance. But like the music itself is what crosses the border and when they and 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 music itself even in that fourth concerto that you played peter 
is sort of an embodiment of that world where you have contrasting forces and music tries to make them at least sort of understand each other. If it's not going to change their mind, at least they sort of can coexist. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the great messages um, and symbols that is music. Right. I'm sorry. Things are popping up here. Uh, Ari, I think you maybe had a reaction to, uh, to what Jesse just said. Yeah, I mean, I've been, I was thinking as you were talking about the way in which, like the question of openness, right, like of music, and, and taken from a couple of different angles. I mean, one thing that we had discussed a little bit in the kind of pre-conversation to this was the way, you know, Beethoven has this kind of model of genius and who can lay claim to that model of genius, right? And, and the ways in which, you know, first of all, we already discussed a little bit the idea that, well, is that universal genius only open to Germans or is it only open to white men or whatever else, right? Um, and, and I think though what you're speaking to, what both of you have spoken to in different ways is the kind of way in which that's not a simple question. And the way in which, you know, the experience of performing Fidelio can be incredibly meaningful for prisoners who might not share that, that background, you know, who are by definition, I mean, they're prisoners, they live a different life than Beethoven lived. Um, but also that the experience of hearing music, it's not to say that it's sort of, you know, it, it sort of flatly, like those boundaries cease to exist, right? Because, you know, that they, they obviously do, but that there's this kind of power of music that can, and certainly Beethoven's music time and again is the symbol of this really, that cannot be like reduced simply to like an identity category. He's not, you know, or a particular moment in time that he's composing. There's all sorts of ways in which I can, I could go on and on about how Beethoven is the quintessential early 19th century German composer. Um, but that that saying all of those things only tells you so much about the experience of listening to Beethoven or um, performing Beethoven or, you know, even the symbol that Beethoven has become. Thank you so much. So there's been a, a 250 year history of this uh, composer. Um, I think we all three agree that uh, somehow it does remain meaningful, even today. Uh, and so I'm going to ask uh, both of you to answer this question. What would we say about Beethoven 250 years from now? Um, assuming that the planet is still around uh, and, uh, and so on. So Jesse, what will happen when we have the 500th anniversary of Beethoven's birth? I have no idea. Um, all I can say is that I, I hope that sort of the, the themes, both musical themes and sort of the human themes that this music um, expresses are still important um, and that are still considered valuable because I, I really think they speak to the very core of what it means to be a human um, and I'm, I'm saying this from my own perspective, of course, but, uh, these, these things are, are the things in my opinion that can sort of help humanity come together and that can help bind it together rather than separate it, which there seems to be so much movement toward. Um, so I would hope that these, these things would have a, 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 a larger presence in the thoughts of mankind than they do presently. I, it's that, that would be my hope. I can't predict anything. We don't know that anything, would be my but hope. Uh, those are wonderful sentiments. And Ari, can you address that hypothetical question? What will we yeah. do on the 500th anniversary of Beethoven? You know, it's hard, right? Because like, as a historian, I'm much more comfortable talking about the past than talking about the future. Right. Um, and so in order to try and answer that question, I actually want to talk a little bit about the past. And as I've said before, you know, Beethoven, uh, the Beethoven of the 19th century is become so synonymous with German music and German culture. 
And in the 20th century, and I alluded to this earlier, you know, with sort of the aftermath of the Nazis, really, and this kind of discrediting of German culture and German music, there are certain composers who become incredibly controversial. I mean, Wagner is the obvious example of someone who is inseparable from that kind of legacy. And Beethoven, interestingly, he really is not now. Um, he's, there's, and part of that is because, you know, he's lived, you know, <laughs> over a hundred years earlier. I mean, it's really hard to like put the crimes of the Nazis on his shoulders in any way. Oh, um, and, yeah. But also I would say that there's a way in which Beethoven transfer, goes from being a particular symbol of Germanness to becoming a symbol of both your universal values, universal identities, kind of as, as um, Professor Jones was just alluding to, but also a symbol specifically of Europe, right? Um, the the um, um, the the oh my God, I can't. <laughs> the Ode to Joy winds up becoming performed, you know, as a kind of like air, sort of EU anthem, and is also at the same time performed in 1990 when at German unification reunification, not as a symbol necessarily of Germanness, but of German's open Germany's openness to Europe. Right, which is this kind of incredible transformation. And the reason I'm telling that story is to say that like Beethoven as a symbol and has has changed immeasurably over the last 200 and, you know, years of his composing life. And so it's impossible for me to imagine that music this powerful isn't going to continue to be relevant 250 years from today. What that relevance is, I, I'm not going to presume to say, but what I will say is that whatever is important to us or to whoever lives in 250 years, Beethoven will be in some way a symbol of that. No, I really appreciate that. And I was hoping that would be a good uh, final thought. But, um, you know, I wrote a, a response to a letter to the review a few uh, months ago, uh, which said, why are we doing so much Beethoven? And, uh, you know, I kind of answered it. Uh, but I wanted to, what, one of the points I made was that uh, he was not a god, and I think Jesse also alluded to that. Uh, he was a working musician who also had to pay the rent and all those kind of things uh, and deal with society as it was. Uh, but somehow, um, through all of that, there's a kind of a nobility of spirit that always comes through. Uh, there's a kind of an elevated sense of what, what humanity means, and I think that um, would remain a legacy uh, you know, hopefully for the next 250 years. So, uh, so wonderful to speak to both of you and uh, I, I really enjoyed this conversation. Likewise. Thanks so much. Thank you, it was a pleasure.